Welcome to video four in our series on tensor calculus. Today we're going to take an in-depth look at affine coordinates. Let's start with a two-dimensional space and construct a coordinate system. First we choose a point for the origin. Then we draw a horizontal line through the origin, which we will call the Z1 axis. Then we draw a vertical line through the axis, which we call the Z2 axis. Now if we wish to find the coordinates of a point P in our space, what we need to do is to draw a couple of segments parallel to the axes that we've created, and it looks like this. We now have a coordinate system. The distance from the Z2 axis to the point is our first coordinate of 4, and the distance from the Z1 axis to the point is our second coordinate, 3. You'll notice as I move the point around, the coordinate values change accordingly. Another thing that's often done is to create a grid that looks like this. And this grid consists of what we call coordinate lines. For example, the line down here, if I move left and right along this line, you'll notice the Z2 component does not change. It remains at 1. Here the value is 2, here it's 3, and so on. So these represent points or, or lines of constant value for each of the coordinates accordingly. All right, well, surely you've recognized this as simply the Cartesian coordinate system, and I expect you have a lot of experience with it and comfort working with it. But there are a couple of things I want to point out before we move on. First of all, the location of the origin was arbitrary. We just picked a spot on our space, but it could have been anywhere else. It could be down here or up here. And in any case, you'll notice that the coordinate values change when I move this origin around. Also, we selected the orientation of our system such that the Z1 axis was a horizontal line. Well, we didn't have to do that. We could have a, an orientation such that it's tilted like this. So uh, as we move the origin around and change the orientation, we notice that these coordinate values change. And that just uh, emphasizes the fact for us that the coordinate values are, I guess I'll call it artificial. They're, they're not um, inherent properties in the point P. The point P is the point P. It exists in this location in our space no matter what coordinate system we use. So the coordinates are highly dependent upon where we locate the origin and how we orient the coordinate axes. Now another thing I want to illustrate here is the concept of scaling. In a coordinate system there are, uh, we refer to things called units, but there are two types of units. First we refer to a thing called an Euclidean unit, and that's simply the unit of measure that we use in the space to measure distances between points. It really has nothing to do with the coordinate system. It's simply the, the metric inside the space itself. But then we also refer to something we call a coordinate unit. Now in the case you see here, the Euclidean unit and the coordinate unit are the same thing. The actual distance in the space from the Z2 axis to the point is 4, and the coordinate value is 4. But I can introduce something known as a scale. The Euclidean unit and the coordinate unit are related by a scaling factor. In this case, it's 1. Well, let me change the scaling factor of Z1 to a value of 2. Now watch what happens when I do it. You'll see that the coordinate lines have expanded, so they're now twice as wide as they were before. You'll also see the coordinate value has changed to 2. Well, the distance from the Z2 axis to the point is still four Euclidean units, but it's only two coordinate units because we have a scaling factor of two. And we can do the same thing in the Z2 direction. 
and it doesn't have to be the same scale. Let's change this one to 0.5. And when we do that, you see that the point didn't change, the relative position to the origin didn't change. We still have um, a point that is three units above the Z1 axis, but now the coordinate value is six. We'd say the coordinates of P in this coordinate system are two and six. And yet the point itself is not two units from the Z2 axis and so on. This is known as scaling. Well, there's something else we can do. And that is, um, originally we chose the two axes to lie at right angles to each other. Well, we don't have to do that. This was originally 90 degrees. We could have chosen two axes that actually were inclined to each other by an angle like this. So I now have a coordinate system where the axes are inclined at 52 degrees. There's a scaling factor of 2 for Z1, a scaling factor of 1 half for Z2. Now, you'll notice the coordinate values as they change inside this particular configuration. Now, all of what I've shown you here are examples of what we refer to as affine coordinates. Affine coordinates are coordinate systems in which all the lines are straight, and they're all parallel to one another, and everything is linear. Let me also point out that when the axes are inclined at an angle like this, they're said to be skewed or we would refer to this as a skew coordinate system. Now this is opposed to coordinate systems where the axes are at right angles to each other. We refer to that as being orthogonal. And I'm sure you picked up on the idea that a Cartesian coordinate system is one type of affine coordinate system, but it is a specific type of affine coordinate system in that it is orthonormal. Orthonormal simply means that the coordinate axes are perpendicular to each other or orthogonal and the scaling factor of all coordinates are 1, meaning that the Euclidean unit and the coordinate unit are the same everywhere. Okay, let me flip over to three dimensions and I'll show you that everything we've done carries over there. Okay, here I have constructed three orthogonal axes, one running left and right, one running up and down, and one running forward and backward into and out of the page. The next thing I'll do is to establish this uh, three-dimensional coordinate system as one which will measure the coordinates in a right-handed sense. Now, to do that, I will label um, the axis coming out of the page as increasing and the value of Z1, so it'll be the Z1 axis. Then I'll label the axis to the right as the Z2 axis, meaning that the Z2 coordinate will increase going right, and I will label the axis going upward as the Z3 axis, meaning the Z3 coordinate increases as we go upward. Now, we know that this is a right-handed orientation, by uh, using uh, a little process with the right hand. Take your index finger, imagine pointing it in the direction of the Z1 axis, that is out of the page. Then take your middle finger and point it in the direction of the Z2 axis, which would be to the right. And when you do that, your thumb will be pointing in the Z3 direction upward. So because it fits in your right hand that way, we know it's a right-handed orientation. Now, if we were to change the orientation of any one of the individual axes, it would switch to a left-handed orientation. For example, uh, imagine the Z1 axis pointing inward. Uh, you'd have to repeat the process we just did by pointing your left index finger into the page your left middle finger to the right and your left thumb would point upward. That means it's a left-handed orientation. Um, you can play with it a little bit and see that the same would happen if you point Z1 out of the page, Z2 to the right, and Z3 downward. You'd have to twist your hand around. You'd see that's left-handed. Anyway, um, 
all that to say that the orientation is a a preference it's either one is valid you just need to establish it and then stick with it uh, throughout the use of the coordinate system I tend to gravitate toward a right hand orientation because it's easier for me to see and I, I think it's more commonly used but uh, again either one is valid as long as you stick with the preference once you've done it okay let me remove these labels and we can whirl this around a little and you can get an idea of the three-dimensional nature of it we have this point P hanging out there in space well if we drop all of these uh, parallel segments like we did in two dimensions this time it forms a box because all the parallel lines actually go back and intersect the planes and to get a feeling for it we have to construct the uh, the box that we have here now you'll see that the segment along here the Z1 coordinate is 5 meaning that it's 5 units from point P back to the plane created by the Z2 and Z3 axes the Z2 coordinate is 3 the Z3 coordinate is 4 now um, I'm not going to go through all the details what we did before but everything we said before applies here for example if we were going to scale the Z1 coordinate you'd see the value of Z1 change as I change the scaling the point doesn't change but the coordinate change because I choose a different scale all right we can also skew the coordinates and that's what I really wanted to show you we have an angle back here that is the angle between the Z1 and the Z2 axes and I'll tilt it down and I'll actually change the value to skew those coordinates to a much smaller value and when we do that you'll notice that what was a box before now takes on the shape of, of sort of a diamond shape I think we call this a parallel pipette if I recall properly and of course we can do the same thing with each of the other angles as well there's an angle between these two coordinate axes that can be changed there's an angle between um, let's see we have this one and we can change it this is the angle between these two axes which we can change when we get through doing all of that then we wind up with something that it uh, looks a little bit like a quartz crystal something like that rotate this around and you see what I mean okay so that's the idea of affine coordinates we'll continue on in the next video when we talk about curvilinear coordinates